so happy to see each and every one of you. And um, I'm quite excited about today. I feel excited about the lesson, even though the name of the lesson is not a very nice name. It's going to be about sin. But I really believe that this is such an important lesson. We need to really understand what sin is all about because that's what separated us from God. And different people have different ideas of what is sin. And I pray that today's lesson is going to clarify in our minds, according to God's word, what is sin? So let's start with question number one. It says the saddest fact, notice that doesn't say theory, all right? Theories are something that haven't been proven, but when God's word states it, then we know it is a fact. It is not just a theory that people are working on, all right? The saddest fact about man is that he is a sinner. What is sin? All right, so 1 John 5, 17 uh, is the one we're going to read, all right? But let's just wait. It says here, we have four things under uh, what is sin. So the first answer is all unrighteousness is sin. All right. All unrighteousness is sin. Um, would, would you read that for us, Toyin? Yes. First John 5, verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Okay, so evidently there is a sin that, you know, when you reach that climax, there's no way to be forgiven by that sin. But all sin can be forgiven, all right? And it says all unrighteousness is sin. So what is righteousness? We're going to look at two types of righteousness. One is man's righteousness and one is God's righteousness. So let's look at man's righteousness first. That's found in Isaiah 64, verse six. Okay. Isaiah, verse 64, sorry, chapter 64, verse six. But we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Now and this, all do, I'm yeah. sorry, continue. And we, okay. And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Yeah. So when it says that all our righteousnesses, that means our good acts are like filthy rags. And this filthy rags actually means like a woman's menstruous rag or cloth. Uh, we, we don't preserve those things. We don't keep them. We throw them away. They're good for nothing, all right? They're, ooh, okay. So this is what our right, what man thinks is good. Man's goods works in God's eyes are like a menstruous rag, an unclean thing, all right? Let's look at Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is, in God's eyes, there is nobody that is righteous. What we think of as good and good works, in God's eyes, the eyes of holy God. Remember, we studied one of the other classes that when man was created, he was created just like God, all right? He was on an even par. Let's make man in our image after our likeness. And of course, God is holy. And when he made man, man was holy. And he could be on an equal par with God, fellowship with God, talk with God, uh, walk and commune with God. But when sin came into the world, man fell, all right? And no matter how hard a person tries to be good and do good things, as far as God's eyes and acceptability in God's eyes, 
no, it's all filthy and dirty. And he says, actually, there's not even one person in the eyes of God that is righteous. Now let's go to God's righteousness, shall we? Uh, Romans 10, 3 and 4. Are they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. All right. So most people fit into this category. They're quite ignorant of God's righteousness. Like I mentioned the other day in one of my classes, I was talking to this young man. This was many years ago, and I'd gone house to house and uh, met this young businessman. And as I shared the gospel with him, and he fully agreed with everything I was telling him. You know, yeah, man is a sinner. And yes, he agreed with all of it. And then when I asked him if he would like to pray and confess his sin to God, he said, oh, when I, when I do a real bad thing, then, then I'll do that. So you see, no, even though he heard about it all, in his eyes, he was still good. He hadn't done anything that bad that he should have to repent and confess it before God. And you'll be surprised how many people feel that way about themselves, all right? So because they're ignorant of the holiness of God, how holy God is, all right? And so it says they go about to establish their own righteousness. They have their own code of ethics. They have their own idea of what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. And they're going about trying to make themselves good enough to be, in fact, friends, every religion, including Christianity as a religion, is man trying to be good enough for God. It's all based on work your way to heaven, work your way to salvation. So it says because people are ignorant, they have not submitted, they have not agreed with God when God says, no, everybody has sin and I want to change you, I want to clean you up, but you have to first admit that. So, you know, it says here in verse four, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. You know what this says to me? Christ is the end of any kind of self-effort and trying to be good enough to please God. <clears throat> After Jesus came, God accepted him. We can stop trying to be good and if we'll just submit to God, accept Jesus, then and believe what God has to say about his son, we don't have to go all of our life trying to meet God's standards. All right. Christ is the ultimate end. He fulfilled everything God desired. All right. And all we have to do is believe that. Now, um, let's go to number no Romans you're going to add this Christ is God's righteousness all right I, I want you to uh, put there Romans 3 22 and verse 25 two separate verses Romans 3 verse 22 even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. All right. Since these verses aren't on your paper you need to write it there all right it is very good because romans 322 tells us all right the righteousness of god only comes to us is only available to us 
by the faith of Jesus Christ, not just faith in Jesus, but faith that he gives you in order to believe it. And notice it says it is offered to all. It is available to all. It says unto all, unto all, the whole world. God did not say he loved the whole world, but only certain people. No, he has offered it to every person uh, that is alive and that will be alive in ages to come. It's been offered to everybody, all right? But it only comes upon all. It is only experienced by those who put their faith in Jesus Christ or the faith that Jesus, God gives them, all right? So it's offered to everybody, but not everybody experiences it. Not everybody has the privilege of, you know, really walking in the light of the fact I am the righteousness of God. I am clothed with the righteousness of God. Only those that believe what God has to say about Jesus, and we follow it by confessing, repenting, then his righteousness is counted on our account. I think we all understand bank accounts, all right? And even though we don't see it in our hand, I don't know about you, but I, I can, you know, take my little iPhone and I can go into my bank and I can see what is credited to my account. And so this righteousness of God has been credited to your spiritual account and my spiritual account when we dare to believe, when we accept God's standard and submit to it, all right? So uh, it says there is no difference. It doesn't matter who you are, what country you're from, how old you are, how young you are. It's unto all, but it will only come upon all when we believe, all right? That verse 25, whom that is talking about Christ, uh, whom God has set forth. God set Jesus Christ, all right, to be a propitiation. Now, let, let us talk about that word. I've discussed it in other classes. Uh, and even if I've discussed it in this class, we're going to discuss it again. That's a big word, propitiation. It means an atoning sacrifice, a sacrifice that fully covers, fully pays for all sin. That's what propitiation means. I usually tell a little example or illustration that I made up, but I think it pretty well covers it. And that is um, if you're in a very, very cold country, freezing cold country, and there are no electric blankets, electric mattresses and so forth, all right? And you're given one blanket or one quilt and that's got to take care of you. And when you try to use it, you pull it up here, your legs are hanging out. So you put your toes in it, pull it down to cover your toes, then it pulls it down here. So you get the idea, Never mind. I'll roll up in a ball and, and you try to cover with that, but Piccolo chulai, all right, your backsides are hanging out, uh, or if you cover your backsides, the front is, no matter how hard you try, this blanket does not fully cover you, all right? But Jesus, the work he did on the cross, and when he died, he said, it is finished. It is fully paid for, and it is fully it will fully atone and for all of our sin. That's because we know because Jesus was raised from the dead. All right. So let me show you how this is accomplished or um, appropriated into our own lives. Let's see that verse 25 again. Whom God hath set, that's God has set forth Jesus Christ, his son, to be a pro propitiation uh, and a fully atoning sacrifice, one that fully pays and fully covers 
through, here, here's how you get it, through faith in his blood, all right? That means that he shed his blood. That means he gave his life for you and me, all right? It says to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. God will accept the blood of Jesus as a fully atoning sacrifice. If you remember in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, when he was going to take them out of the land of Egypt, he told them, every family take a lamb and it had to be without blemish. And they were to kill this lamb and they were to let the blood go into this bucket. Then they took hyssop and dipped it into that blood and put it on the top of the door and down the two sides of the door. And that night, the death angel went through the whole of Egypt and every door that had the blood covering it, the death angel passed by and never touched anybody in that house. But every house that did not have the blood applied, uh, the eldest son or the eldest animal, all right, in that house, there was death everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. God told them, when I see the blood, in other words, God himself recognized it was the blood of that substitute that he had told them to use. Instead of them dying, the lamb died in their stead. So it is with Jesus, all right? God has said, he is my lamb. He is my sacrifice that I have given. And his death and his blood, all right? When you believe in it, when you let it be applied to your life, then I will recognize that, all right, as remission and forgiveness of sins that are past. I will not only forgive, I will remove all of that sin. And I will put to your account, you are righteous in my sight, all right? Um, now, if I hope you put this Romans 3, 22 and 25 on the left-hand side, and then go over to the right-hand side of your notes and write there, 1 Corinthians 1, 3, 0, 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Yeah, so of God, <clears throat> when we believe in Jesus and believe in his blood, something spiritual takes place and God takes us and puts us into his son. We become a member of the body of Christ, all right? And therefore, Everything that is given to Jesus, like uh, righteousness, wisdom, sanctification, redemption, all that is in Christ. So when I'm put in Christ, he becomes my righteousness. He becomes my wisdom. He becomes my sanctification. He becomes my redemption. This is the way God has stated it and made it. Therefore, it is not myself anymore. So it's, notice what I put on your notes. So what is not of Christ is sin, all right? We're the whole thing is, what is sin? All unrighteousness. The only righteousness God recognizes is his own. That is found in Jesus and the complete work he did as a human being, all right? And... <clears throat> So therefore, whatever is not of Jesus is sin, all right? Let's go to this number two under what is uh, unrighteousness, all right? Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. 
So notice that word, whosoever committeth sin. All right, uh, you're, you're transgressing the law. The law meaning the word of God. All right, whatever God has said, if you go against it, you do the opposite of it. You decide to do your own thing instead of doing. So I call this the sin of commission. Something you do that is against the word of God. It's sin in God's eyes. All right. There's another type of sin. All right. That's under three. James 4, 17. Therefore. To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So this is you don't do anything. You know what you ought to do, but you don't do it. All right? So there's a lot of people, they commit this kind of sin. They know what they should be doing. They read the Bible, and they know what the Bible is telling them, but they're not living according to it. So that is considered sin. That is the sin of omission. You haven't done a thing, but because you knew you ought to do it, you knew what was in God's word, and you just ignore it, that is sin in God's eyes as well, all right? Uh, let's go to number four, going our own way. To me, this is the, the one of the simplest ways of saying what is sin, uh, all right? Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we're, we're like sheep. Sheep need a shepherd. And in the New Testament, uh, Jesus was, he likened himself to the good shepherd. And in fact, the Old Testament also talks about good shepherds and the bad shepherds and the idle shepherds and so forth, all right? So sheep, if they don't have a shepherd, tend to get lost. When they're truly the sheep of a certain fold, they always know their shepherd's voice and they will follow that, their shepherd's voice. They don't just do what they want. When they go away on their own, they usually get lost. They're very... Um, I can't think of the English word, all right? Uh, they're foolish, they're dumb, all right? And I hate to say it, but most of us, before we come to God, that's the way we are. We don't know about him, but we've gone astray. We got lost. And it says we've turned everyone to his own way. We're trying to figure it out for ourselves. We're trying to do our own thing. We're trying to please ourselves. We weren't created to please ourselves. We were created to please God. And when we go our own way, it says the Lord laid on him. And that's Isaiah 53. It's a picture of Jesus. It's the passion of Christ being told in that whole chapter. All right. So all of our sin, iniquity, iniquity is uh, that bent to sin from the inside, all right? That waywardness, that sinfulness, all of it from every person from Adam right down to the end of time, it was put on Jesus. And Jesus took that place, bore that sin, and bore the punishment of that sin on your behalf and on my behalf. So going our own way is sin. Now let's go to question number two. How universal or widespread is sin? And, and I put here just to make it a little more easy to understand, to what extent has sin gone, all right? How far reaching are the effects of sin? First John 5, 19. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. All right. The whole world lieth in wickedness. It is reached to every part 
of creation from one end of the world to the other end of the world, all right? There is no one that is not, has not been touched by the effects of sin. So let's look at Romans 3, 10 to 12, all right? There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. it. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. All right. So there, every person has been touched by sin. Every person has been affected by sin. And this word unprofitable, first I thought of this. You know, God made us for his pleasure. God made us to bring pleasure to his heart and for fellowship. We're unprofitable because now he cannot fellowship with us if we have sin and we cannot bring joy to his heart. We cannot help him fulfill the desires of his heart that he had in mind when he created us. But I decided to look that word up. And actually, unprofitable, it it's comes from a word, you know, that means like rotten fruit. Actually, I didn't look it up. This, I remember uh, when I was studying it yesterday, uh, it, whether it was David Guzik or one of those commentators uh, mentioned this about the rotten fruit, all right? Permanently bad. There's nothing you can do with rotten fruit. You can't sell it. Nobody wants it. It looks all, ooh, and, and the flies start coming around it. it there's nothing you, it's permanently bad. You can't do something to try to, you know, revive it, cause it to come back good. No, it's good for nothing but to be thrown away and destroyed. And so that is what it says. None that doeth good, all right? No, not one. There's no... I know there's a lot of people that think they're pretty good, <laughs> but they're not thinking about the way God sees them. Maybe in man's eyes, they're very good, but not in God's eyes, all right? We're talking about in the eyes of God. Let's look at Psalms 14, one to three. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if they, if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So from this, as we read this, we can tell what was written in Romans was taken from this Psalms 14, all right? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In other words, he thinks it and his actions say it, but he doesn't say it with his mouth, but he's a fool to act as if there's no God, to actually in his heart, he thinks, there's nobody watching, nobody caring, nobody, you know, I can do whatever I want. It's my business, what I do, as long as I do it in private, and nobody sees it. The Bible calls that person a fool, thinking there is no God. They're corrupt, all right? Uh, they've been corrupted, and the things they do are abominable. That means hateful. This is talking about the way God sees it. He, he looked down to see, is there anybody that understands? Understands what? The heart cry of God. Why he made man in the first place. How he longed to have man to fellowship uh, with and also to, because God is a spirit. And, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. God created everything on, and he wanted this man that he made to be on earth, to be able to be his expression and do what he wanted done down here. 
and to supply whatever was needed down here. So he said, did they understand, all right, the desire of God's heart? And did they seek God? What do you mean by seek God? Seek to know him, seek to be like him, seek to please him. No, verse three says, all, all have gone aside. All have, you know, gone astray, like it said in Isaiah. They're all together become filthy. Every one of them, don't take them individually, take them as a group, and they've just become filthy, dirty, unclean, all right? No one that does good, not even one. So that tells us how universal and widespread sin is. It has affected the whole world of human beings, all right? Let's go down to number three. How greatly has mankind sinned? This is now talking about the depth of sin. You know, um, there is, the Chinese have a cake, uh, some kind of quay. I'm, I'm not sure what they call it, but it's layered, you know. And uh, so with this, I'm just going to use that. Let's peel each. If I peel the outer, maybe it's just the outer layer. No, still no good. Peel another layer. No, still no good. Peel another layer. No, it's so no matter how far you go down, sin has penetrated that far. All right, it's talking about the depth. Let, let's look at Genesis 6 5. And this verse actually was written right before God sent the flood and destroyed the whole of mankind except for Noah and his family who found grace in God's sight. Uh, read that, Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Yeah, notice that. To me, this verse is showing the universal depravity of man, all right? To what extent it went down. The wickedness of man was great, all right? Every imagination, not certain ones, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil, nothing good, nothing acceptable. And it was continually. It wasn't once in a blue moon. It was just a constant thing. He was told there was no way he was going to get better. That's why God decided to start a new civilization, if you want to put it like that. Noah found grace, but we find that from Noah's family, though God found grace in them, sin started up again. All of this is to show us, friends, no matter what God does, sin is going to ruin it all. All right. Um, let's see. Let, on our notes here, number one under question three says it penetrated every fiber of his being. Let's look at Isaiah chapter one. All right, verse five and six. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. With whole, the whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises, and putrefying sores. They have not been closed neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. This is the way God sees what sin has done to mankind. It has entered into every fiber of his being, all right, from, we say, from the head to the toe. Here God says, from the sole of the foot right up to the head, there is absolutely nothing good about it. Putrefying sores means totally rotten, where it's erupting and the pus is oozing out. I'm being very um, 
very plain in my language. All right, I'm gonna tell you a story. Uh, this happened actually many years ago when we first started uh, Bethel Assembly of God. And um, we lived, we bought this property and this house, all right? It had no in, indoor toilet. The toilets were all at the back of the building, all right? So, you know, in the night, rather than get up and walk clear to the back, we would keep buckets in our uh, room. So if people had to urinate or uh, pass, they, you usually don't pass motion in the night. It's usually just urinating. So we would keep buckets in the room. Then we didn't have to go. But in the daytime, we had to go outside and go clear to the back. And these were what we call squat toilets, all right? And I remember because the place was for a church. We had changed this big two-story house into a church. So we had one squat toilet for the men, one for the ladies. Then we had another uh, room, we didn't, it was already there. Uh, I don't know if it was where you could turn a tap, you know, whether it was to go in where you could kind of wash yourself off. I can't remember that very clearly, but I know we didn't really use it. So one day I was walking back there and I noticed this third door, it was um, ajar a bit and a kind of a stench was coming out from there. It was rather dark in there. So I, you know, carefully moved that door and peeked in. There was a dog laying there on the floor. His head had an open sore that covered almost the whole of his head. And it was just like this is dog. It was like a putrefying sore worms were crawling in and out. The pus was coming out. He, the poor thing. I looked at that, you know, and I felt I was doing that animal good. I saw what a mess that dog was. There was no way he was going to get better. I telephoned the RSPCA, which in those days, I don't even know really what what it stands for, but I, I remember the, the lettering, the RSPCA, I called them and I told them what was there. I said, I think it would be good if you could come and take this poor creature and get it out of its misery. And it was taken and put to sleep so it wouldn't suffer any longer. But God didn't do that with you and me. He saw us in that state with all that ooh, in the spiritual realm, just oozing with putrefying sores. And instead of putting us out of commission, instead of sending us straight to hell and just saying, get rid of them, they no use to live any longer. Uh, he sent Jesus, his only son, to take our place and die in our stead. Uh, I want us to look at that next um, number three, uh, point three under question number three, Romans 3, 13 to 18 and 23 as a separate verse. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of apps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yeah, this, this is terrible. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, uh, when I was reading here, this poison of asps, all right, the, the asp, when I looked that up, it was, it's a small, very poisonous, like a viper, a, a snake. It's tiny, 
but if they bite you, you're dead. You're, you're dead. It's a very, very poisonous snake. So this is talking about mankind spiritually, all right? Their throat is an open sepulcher. That means an open grave, all right? Where the dead and the stench of death and the disease of death uh, that can be caused by death. That, that, in other words, out of our innermost part of our being doesn't come life. Everything is death, 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 all right? Their feet are swift to shed blood. That means murderous thoughts and ways. There's a man called Warren uh, Wiersbe, all right, W-I-E-R-S-B-E. And he said about this, he said, this is an X-ray study of the lost sinner from head to toe. An X-ray study of the lost sinner from head to toe. This is the way God sees. Doesn't matter what part of our being, from the top to the bottom, when God's X-ray goes and looks in the spiritual realm, there is nothing there, nothing there. Everybody has sin. Every part of our being has sin. And we have come short. That means we have fallen short. No matter how hard we try to climb, we can never get back on this equal par. Struggle, try. None can get up there on God's level. All right. Um, Just a moment here. I think this might be, no, just give me a moment to get my other paper here. Yeah, I think this is a good place that for us to take our, uh, let's take 10 minutes off and come back at, uh, what would it be like about, Five, two. We'll give an extra minute there. A am I right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then we'll start on page two, question four. Okay, shall we come back again? We're on lesson two, part one, which is about sin. And we just finished the third, first three questions. So we're going to start at the top of page two. Who is offended when we sin? All right, the answer is every sin is against God personally. So after that, write Psalms 51, verse four. Psalms 51, verse four, Toyin. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. All right. This is David, King David writing after he had committed the sin of adultery and murder both. All right. Uh, he didn't murder himself, but he put her husband in a position where he was definitely killed. So this is the psalm he wrote after that. And he said, against thee, thee only have I sinned. In other words, all sin, no matter what it is. It's an offense to God, all right, because it hinders us from having communion with God. I'm going to read this next. We won't read it because I just picked it's on your paper. 
all that do unrighteously, all right, are an abomination unto the Lord thy God, all right? All that do unrighteously. So whenever we do things that aren't the way God wants it, the, the things that please him, we do anything that's not righteous, we become an abomination before the Lord. That's what it's saying. All that do unrighteously are an abomination. All right. Abomination on your paper says revolting. This is what it is to God. Very revolting, repudiating, to hate or loathe intently. Very disgusting. We see God is a holy God. All right. And we were made to be in his image. Let's look at Revelation 4, 11, all right? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So we were created not only to be in the image of God, we were created for his pleasure, all right? And therefore, when we do things that are sinful, disgusting, repudiating, you know, that mars us, it, it really is an offense to God, all right? We, uh, let us look at Psalms 106, 39. I'm just gonna read it here. Thus were they defiled, with their own works and went a whoring with their own inventions. Of course, this is talking about idolatry, doing their own thing, making their own gods, all right? And this a whoring means spiritual adultery, spiritual adultery. We were made to be like God. We were made to be joined to God and what, and you know, now, of course, this is talking about the children of Israel who had been chosen by God to be his people. And then they turn from God outwardly. They're still worshiping God, but they go and they make other gods and worship other gods at the same time. And uh, it, it calls it a whoring. It calls it spiritual adultery when they were united to God and then uh, go look for something else. All right, to fulfill, we, be, we have defiled ourselves, become filthy, unprofitable to God, our maker. God, our creator, is offended. Let's go to the second part of question four. Who is offended when we sin? It's against our fellow man. Now, um, I would like to say here that what we do against our fellow man, yes, is also uh, what are some of the sins, all right? And the answer here is nay or no. You do wrong and defraud, all right? And that your brethren. So uh, not all sin, some sins are, everything is against God because he's a holy God. But there are some sins that do affect people. And that's what this is talking about. So I said here, name some specific sins against our fellow man. So I'm going to suggest some to you, because if we take the time to ask people to suggest, uh, it's going to take too long. Lying, cheating, all right, maybe lying, gossiping, because both of those have to do with the mouth, cheating, stealing backstabbing, cruelty, oppression, again with the mouth, cursing, railing, belittling, derogatory, all right, um, anger, temper tantrums, but it usually ends up coming out with the mouth or with the body when you get really angry and you wanna throw things that are hit or uh, harm people, all right because anger can actually lead to murder, all right? So we don't want to belittle anything. 
all of these things that I've named, there's many, many others, not only offend God, but they can be very offensive and harmful to people. All right. Uh, B, um, it's essential to make right with our fellow man. We, if we're going to really accept Christ and that you cannot just let what happened to people just go, we need to make those things right. All right. I, I remember when I lived in Kota Kinabalu, there was a lady that uh, was sent by a doctor. This doctor knew me and she seemed to realize that the lady's problem was more spiritual than it was physical. That's the way I figure. Why else would she tell her to come and see me? I'm not a doctor. So the lady came and um, I didn't know that in at one time in her life, she had known Jesus and later had backslidden and gone away from God. I didn't know any of that. I just thought she was had never known the Lord. So I began to share Jesus with her and um, led her in a prayer. And the moment that she got right with the Lord and, you know, a big smile came on her face, but she took out her phone and she immediately called her brother. They had been estranged. I don't know what had happened. And there was this estrangement between the two of them who had done wrong to who I don't know but I just know I heard her on the phone asking for forgiveness and wanting to make things right and telling you know I've just found Jesus in my heart and I know I need to make this right with you I've confessed it all to God but I need to make it right with you all right uh, I'm going to tell you another story that took place. This was a sinner or what they call now pre-believers. This was, oh, 40, 50 years ago when we had a huge tent meeting in our yard. And our speaker was this lady that um, was from Hong Kong. She was a Cantonese movie star. I, I knew her as Madam Kong, but I think she was known as Mui Yi. That was her uh, screen name, Mui Yi. And um, so it was during her meeting, this um, Taoist family, uh, they came to the Lord. They accepted the Lord. All right. They were business people. And um we had, we had a church over in Katong, that's where they lived, and they st started attending our Chinese service over there. One day she came to me, of course she was talking in Chinese, she said, I have two sons, my eldest son is, I don't know, 21, 22, something like that, and um, said, I would really like him to accept the Lord, would you be willing, he speaks English, you know, uh, would you be willing to come to my house and witness to it? So I said, sure. And, and I went there, you know, he was very easy to witness to. She had been a Christian now for maybe a few weeks and she had been baptized in the Holy Spirit as well, not just born again, but baptized in the Holy Spirit. So when I went there to talk to him, everything I said to him, he, he just nodded his head. He agreed with anything and everything I said. So right away, while I was doing my witnessing to him, I was wondering, you know, is this guy for real? You know, uh, does he really agree with me? Or is he just like, okay, just whatever you say, yes, 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 yes. And then soon she'll leave and then you know so I already had this doubt in my mind then when I got all finished talking anything I asked him the answer would be yes do you believe that all have sinned oh yes do you believe that, that they're going to go to hell yes you know 
Do you believe there's no other way except to really open up, repent, and confess our sin and ask Jesus to come? Yes. Would you like to do it? Yes. I mean, it was so simple and so easy. I, I really doubted whether uh, it was true. No crying, no uh, outward sign, but he prayed the prayer. And after he finished praying, the mother was in the same room. Uh, he turned to his mother and he said something. It was not really important that I could tell. And um, so after a little while, I looked at my watch and I realized it was time for me to go. So I told the mother, I think it's time for me to leave. And they lived upstairs. So we had to go down some stairs to the front door. And when we got down there, I just, he, she said to me, she said, oh, praise the Lord. He is really born again. And I just got the shock of my life. I said to her, how do you know? You know, I know the Bible says if, if we pray, but sometimes people pray, they don't mean it from their heart and nothing really happens. But she knew he was born again. So I said, how do you know? She said, did you notice he talked to me? I said, yes. What's that got to do with it? She said, for before I was ever saved, there was some, I don't know what happened, but a rift came and they did not talk together for over two years. If they wanted to talk, they went through the younger brother. Uh, so the older brother would tell the younger brother, the younger brother would go and tell the mother. If the mother wanted to talk to him, she had to go to the young. They would not talk to each other. When the mother got saved, she tried talking to him. He would have nothing to do with her. So that whole thing kept on going through the third party in order to communicate. And there, the moment he invited Jesus into his heart, he turned and he started talking to his mother and to the mother. Uh, later, of course, he got baptized in the spirit. They were baptized in water. It, it was a marvelous thing. But you see, when we're truly born again, then we seem to know that we need to be right with our fellow man as well. All right. So um, this B, it, it, it's a, it says uh, essential to make right with our fellow man. Matthew 5, 23, all right, and um, 24. It is really, this one is referring to Christians, all right. Um, it's referring to us who already know the Lord. And it says, if you bring your gift to the altar, that means you come here to worship God, all right? And you remember your brother has ought against you. In other, you remember you've done something offensive that has offended your fellow uh, man, all right? Then you need to, leave. don't keep worshiping God. Leave the gift before the altar and go first be reconciled to your fellow man and then come and continue worshiping the Lord. All right. Um, let's look at number three of question four. We have sinned against heaven. Now, this one definitely, this is talking about the prodigal son, all right? Um, Luke 15, 21. Let me tell you a little bit of the background of this story. I'm sure you all know the story of the prodigal son who said, Father, how he had the nerve when the father wasn't dead to say, please give me my portion of the inheritance. And the father did give it to him while he was still alive. But this is talking about us with our heavenly father, the, the God that created all of us. He has given life to us. He has given everything to us. And, you know, we in turn are like a prodigal son when we take all that God has given and we go and just live to ourselves, please ourselves, 
enjoy ourselves and use everything God's given us for our own pleasure instead of God's pleasure. In the end, this story or parable, all right, when he ran out of the money that his father had given to him, he found out his friends weren't his friends. When he no longer had money, they couldn't be bothered with him. And then he had no job, he had no income. Finally, he goes and gets a job feeding swine or pigs and nobody gave him to eat. He was so hungry, he would have liked to have eaten the pig's food, but he didn't dare because he didn't have the permission to take that and feed himself. So he thinks to himself, my father's so rich, my father's so wealthy, even his servants are better off than me. I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to repent and I'm going to confess and I'm going to ask him to let me be his servant. That means do his will, please him. At least I'll get food, I'll get shelter, I'll get clothes that I don't have doing it my own way. So in a way, this is a picture of all of us who are in sin because God made us, yet we have become like a prodigal son to run away. And this says, I'm gonna go. And he changed, he had this change of heart and mind. And he goes, you know, some people, when they make up their mind to do something, and then they get there, like this young man, when he came, the Bible says the father was out there watching, looking, waiting every day for that son to return home. And when the father saw him dirty, filthy, smelly, think about it. He had been feeding the pigs and living amongst the pigs and his life was just a mess. The father went and grabbed him, hugged him, and welcomed him home. You know, right then, some people would say, oh, good, good, you know, and then never admit they're wrong. But this, this boy, no. All right. So let's see what it says here. I think as long as I'm talking here, I'm just going to read it myself. Father, I have sinned against heaven. And in your sight, and am no more worthy to be called your son. All right. Just let me be a servant. And so we see here that um, he not only sinned against his earthly father, but he realized he sinned against God, the heavenly father. All right. That's what he meant by against heaven and in your sight. And so I'm not worthy to be called a son. And just let me be your servant. But we know the story. God accepted him back as a son. All right. But let, let's look here in um, just a moment. I think I'll tell the rest of the story probably in lesson three, because I remember studying and there was uh, more to it than, than that. So, but I think that comes up in lesson three. So let's leave that as it is and go to Ezekiel 36, 22 and 23. Uh, Toy and read it for us, please. Okay. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. All right. So 
you know, when, especially we who do know the Lord, all right, when we turn around and uh, sin, go back into sin, all right, it, he says that what he did wasn't for our sake. It's because of his holy name, all right? And when we profane it, but our lifestyle can profane God. That means make him common, make him seem un unclean or sanctify it. That means let people know by our life that the God we serve is a holy God. All this is shown by our lifestyle. That, that's why when anybody sins, it's not just against a person or God, it's against heaven itself because it leaves a very wrong picture in the eyes of people. If that's what it means to be a Christian, if that's what it means to be a child of God, I don't wanna be a child of God. And there are people that have been totally turned off of coming to God because people who claim with their net mouth to know God by their lifestyle, by their dealings, their shady dealings, uh, they've left a very bad picture of God. And people that might have accepted and gone to heaven, all right, end up dying and going to hell because our lives were such that it turned people off. All right, can a sinner change himself? This is question number five. No, you'll notice I put two exclamation points. You can put more if you want. Never, never, never. So uh, Toyin, Job 14.4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. There's no way if something is unclean, uh, inside, outside, no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to bring something clean out of it. Micah 7.4. The best of them is as a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. All right. Th this is the way God sees people. The you know, the best, those who think they're so good, they're like a briar. A briar is one of those wild weed things that also has little sticky things on them. They're worthless, all right? Worthless except to burn. The most upright, I don't care how good you are outside of Jesus, outside of God, your life is like a thorn hedge full of prickly, you know, thorns that when you get too close, you get hooked and hurt and harmed. It can even bring blood to you, all right? So this is talking about man's righteousness. Now, we're going to um, go to our next, our last page, all right? We're, st we're still on uh, question five, but we're number three under five, all right? Psalms 49, six to eight. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. Verse eight, for the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever. All right. So this is telling us, all right, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, how much money you have, none of us can pay the price and redeem back, all right, for the price of sin. I cannot help you. You cannot help me. No amount of money can be given to uh, pay the ransom for a sinner. And get. it doesn't matter how much wealth you have, how many riches you have, you, you can't do it. That's all. 
the the price is really um, very precious. It took the blood of God's only Son. Let's look at First Peter one eighteen. Okay. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversion, conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. All right, so, you know, when it says you're not redeemed with corruptible things and it says very clearly like silver or gold that was exactly what we were talking about salvation in this world money means things money means you can have whatever you want but in the realm of the spirit money is worthless money cannot buy that's why churches that charge for penance, all right? You pay so much money and then prayers will be said for you in, in our, no, no, no. In the realm of the spirit, money can buy nothing. And so we just have to quit thinking in terms of this life where money is everything. That's why God says you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the God of riches the God of riches, it's, you know, no, you either serve the true and the living God, which is a spirit, and we have to serve him in spirit and in truth, and there's nothing that can remove sin except, all right, and it says it's a very precious thing, it's his blood, right here, 19, with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb, God's lamb, without blemish, no spot, no, uh, nothing amiss, no sin, nothing that is sinful in him. He was the only one that could be without sin. And verse 20 says that he was foreordained. He was pre-planned before the foundation of the world, before God ever created the world. His son, was called the word of God up there in heaven, all right? He didn't have a body. He was a spirit of God, the father, God, the son, all right? But he, he was a spirit. He was the word of God. He spoke the worlds into existence. But way back there before the world was ever formed, before the first man was ever formed, you might say, if God knew that, you know, Adam was going to sin, why did he create him? Why didn't he create him unable to sin? I'm going to answer that right now. All right. The reason is, and I'm going to ask all of you the same question. How many of you want a robot for your wife or your husband or your child? All right. A robot. Here I am. I am programmed. I have to love you. Tell me what you want. I will go do it now. Do you really think you would be happy with a robot? Well, neither was God happy with a robot. All right. And he didn't want a robot. So he created man like himself with a free will to be able to choose and to want or not want, to accept or reject. And this plan was way before he created man. He knew that man, not everybody was going to accept him. But those that would accept, he was going to be good to them in every way. Uh, all the good things of life are offered to everybody. But those who chose not to follow God, well, that's the way that it is. All right. So don't blame God go right back to where the blame belongs. Each and every one of us are responsible for the choices that we make, all right? Uh, let's go back now to 
uh, number four under question five, all right? Number four under question five. We're talking about can a sinner change himself? The answer is no, all right? So please read that for us, Toyin. Jeremiah 13, verse 23? Yes. Yes, okay. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed, accustomed to do evil. Yeah. So a person cannot change the color of his skin. You might add something to it. You might try to do something, but to really totally change the color of your skin, it's impossible. At the same with the leopard. The leopard has big spots, all right? He had, most of his body is kind of a brownish. And then there's these black spots all over his skin. Can a leopard change it so that he has just one color? No, he cannot. So it says the same thing with us. We who are accustomed to do evil, we who have sinful natures, no matter how hard you try, you cannot change your being to want to be to do good. I'm talking about in the sight of God. Being acceptable in this, it's impossible for us to be able to change ourselves. Jeremiah 2.22, Toyin. For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. All right. So what, what I've said there, no amount of acid will help. I actually looked it up and it's carbonate of soda, which is really, uh, uh, I, I don't know if it's an acid, but uh, carbonate of soda, sorry. It, if you wash yourself with whatever it is that kills this, kills that, kills the other, all right? Or if you take a lot of soap, soap is very good to kill germs and to, you know, make yourself clean. That's outward, that's outward, but that cannot do anything for your heart. It says your iniquity is marked before me. It's indelibly marked there uh, all right and nothing in this life and nothing that you apply in this life is able to remove that indelible stain that sin has made upon us all right only the blood of jesus can remove it all right only the blood of jesus that's there's nothing else that can change all right so now let's go to this. What is the end of the sinner? I just, I ask God to help me to be able to finish this whole lesson. This one question is quite a long question. All right. Um, what is the, and above that word end, put their ultimate end. All right. I, I should have written that instead of just the end because You'll think of just the natural end, but the ultimate end is spiritual, all right? Natural and spiritual. That's why I've got two parts to this answer. The first one is physical death, and the second one is spiritual death, all right? Uh, the physical death, all right, the body dies, all right? Let's look at these verses. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. All right. If you remember when God created mankind, uh, he created him from the dust of the earth after he made this mud man all right it's dead then he breathed into the nostrils and it said man um man became a living soul had eternal life 
life breathes within. What is the soul? All right. The soul is the person, the personality. All right. Mind, will, and emotions. Okay. You, you remember, uh, and you, if you want to just put on your paper someplace to look at Genesis 2, verse 7. All right. Um, in that Garden of Eden, he put the tree of the knowledge. This is Genesis 2, 17. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they were told, you shall not eat of it. Um, and they were told, in the day that you eat of this tree, you will surely die. All right. And um, of course, God meant spiritually, but physical death started to take place from that moment on. All right. Let's look at James uh, 2.26. The soul that we just read, the soul that sinneth. God claims everybody as his, whether it's a father or a son. He's the one that created man. Ultimately, man belongs to God. But God made that statement very clearly. The soul, the person, all right? Not just the body, the person inside that soul. Uh, if it continues to sin, it is going to die, all right? Physically as well as spiritually. Continue. What is physical death? James 2.26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without, faith without works is dead also. All right. So when the spirit leaves the body, all right, when the spirit leaves the body, the body is dead. I still remember that early wee hours of the morning, all right, on the 6th of October. When they woke me up, I was in the same room as my husband, but not in the same bed. And um, I got close to him. And I remember I put my, my finger on his ear. And then suddenly that thing showed. He was gone. He was gone. He still felt warm, but he was gone. Before that, I could talk to him and his body would respond to me. But now I could talk to him. And though the body still felt warm because it had just happened, he couldn't talk anymore. The body couldn't respond anymore. All right. Because the spirit had gone out. The spirit and the soul are together, all right? As long as the spirit and the soul, now the spirit might be dead in trespasses and sins, but they live inside the body. And through the body, that soul can express itself to the world through the spirit. But if it's dead, which most people, if they don't know God, that's already dead. Uh, they're just left there. It's that. But when we come to Jesus, we're given a, a new spirit, created a new being. And these two always go together. So when the spirit leaves the body, the soul leaves with it. And therefore, it, the body is dead. All right. Um, then it mentions their faith without works. If you really have faith, you will find works of faith in your life. Your lifestyle will show it. We won't go into that because you're going to teach this to those who don't know the Lord. All right. Remember up there in Ezekiel 18.4, God's declaration there is sin brings death. All right. You can write that by the side of Ezekiel 18.4, sin brings death. Okay, let's go now to 
C under 6 1. Romans 6 23. I think I'll just quote this one for the wages of sin is death. You know, when you talk about a wage, you talk about earning something, working for something, deserving payment for your life and your works. All right. When you work for another person, uh, he gives you wages either once a week or once a day or once a month, uh, according to the agreement. But here it talks about sin, committing sin. It's a choice that you and I make. We choose to do our own thing. We choose to go our own way. And there is a wage. You get what comes to you. When you choose your own way, there's a wage. And that wage of sin, you deserve it. You earned it. You live for it. You work for it is death, all right? But it says the gift of God. God is saying, I have a gift. Gift, you don't earn it. Gift, you don't deserve it. Gift, you don't work hard to get it. No, 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 it's a gift. The Chinese term is very clear. Bye, bye, tsugeni. Uh, I don't know how to explain that saying in English. Um, without any strings attached, you it has nothing to do, even, you know, we say, it's my birthday. And we think because it's my birthday, I have a right to my gift. No, a gift, even though it's given to you on your birthday, the person that gave it out of their free will, they celebrate your birthday, but you can't demand a gift. It's no longer a gift when you demand it. Isn't that right? So it says God isn't giving us what we deserve. He wants to give us a gift, which is no strings attached. It's totally clear of work and labor and effort. And that gift is eternal life. Oh, not just to live forever because you can live forever in hell. But this eternal life is talking about in heaven with God. Oh, where there's no sickness, there's no death, there's no sorrow. It's just beautiful. And this eternal life that he's promised to us as a gift comes through Jesus Christ. So when you accept Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, when you ask Jesus to come into your life, he is eternal life. He comes into you. He's a gift from God to us. And we have the promise that we will live forever in the presence of God. Let's look at D. Genesis 3, 19. We're still talking about the end of the sinner, which the first part is physical death. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. All right. It's talking about the body, all right? It's talking about the body being buried. It is not talking about cremation. I'm sorry to bring that up, but I have to bring that up, all right? Everything in the body, I mean, in the Bible talks about death being buried because, you know, it talks about us, uh, the seed falling into the ground. Please don't tell this to your non-Christian friends. This is just for Christians right now, all right, that I'm telling you this. But it says, except a seed fall into the ground and die it will remain alone. But when it goes into the ground, it's buried there in the ground, then that brings forth life. Have you ever seen a farmer take his seed and burn it, cremate it, and then try to bury it? No, 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 no. There's no life then, 
All right, that's all I'm going to say. So this is talking about the body when it dies is buried from dust you were taken and to dust you are going to return. Okay, so that's the first part of the end of a sinner. The body dies, we were made from dust, our bodies are put back into the ground. Number two, there is a spiritual death as well because when the spirit leaves the body, we're talking about the sinner. For those of us who accept the eternal life that God has given, our spirits go up to heaven. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. My husband's body is in a grave somewhere, disintegrating into dust. But he is not there. His spirit is up in heaven. He's very much alive. My son is very much alive, though his body is in a grave here in Singapore, disintegrating in that grave. But his spirit is up in heaven. But for the end of the sinner, when their spirit leaves their body, it goes to hell. All right. 917 of Psalms, Toyin. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Mm. So all the peoples, that's what nations stand for. A nation is made up of people. All the people, the wicked, all right, are going to go, to, they're going to, their spirits go to hell. Hell is just where spirits are, all right? No bodies are in hell. The body goes into the ground, but this, yeah, but the spirit goes into hell. All right, let's go to this next one. Luke 16, verse 19 uh, to 31. That, that's a pretty long portion of scripture. Um, um wow you you go ahead and start reading it um toyin okay. but read it one verse at a time and let me uh comment as we go along okay there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuous sumptuously every day and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate full of sores. All right. Now, I want you to realize one thing here. This is not a parable. Parables do not name people. This is a true story. All right. Um, Lazarus is given a name. The rich man is not because the Bible tells us those that go to hell, their name will be remembered no more. Okay. But Lazarus did not go to hell, though he was a big. This has nothing to do with one was rich, one was poor. It has to do with one believed in God and one did not believe in God. And though the Lazarus, who is a beggar, he, he didn't have the good things here in life, all right? The other man was very rich and very wealthy. Verse 21. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. I mean, it's showing his place as a, really a sad state, all right? He didn't have anything and he was near this lived outside of this rich man's house, hoping for maybe they would throw something out that they didn't want, that they couldn't eat, so he could maybe have a little bit to eat, all right? Um, going back to that word hell, put there, it is a real place of fire. Hell, it talks about hell fire. This is not just a name. It is a place that has fire, all right? And the spirit goes there if it doesn't go up to heaven. All right, let's go to 22. 
And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. All right. For this beggar, nobody cared for him. In fact, we were told in verse 21, while he was alive, uh, the dogs came. He had sores because he didn't eat properly and his body broke out with sores. The dogs even came and licked his sores. It's a, a real sad state here. But now it's talking about when these two, the beggar and the rich man, each of them die. But what, nobody cared for the beggar's body. There, it doesn't tell us he was buried. Don't know, maybe even those same dogs that licked his sores ate him up. Just like Jezebel, when she was thrown out, the dogs ate her up. So there are dogs that eat dead bodies if they ha are laying around there, all right. He died, at, but so what, what his spirit and his soul are carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, there was a place before Jesus came. All right, this is in the middle of the earth. One portion has this hell with fire in it. There's a separation. There's another place. It was called Abraham's bosom. Uh, they did not go straight to heaven at that time. Only after Jesus died, arose from the dead, he took those out of Abraham's bosom and he brought them up into the presence of God. But until then, uh, Abraham's bosom is considered the place where those that knew God, loved God, they were there waiting for the Savior to come and die. All right. So we see the beggar, nobody cared for his body. There was no burial, but his soul and his spirit were brought to what we call Abraham's bosom. But the rich man, when he died, his body was buried. All right. Verse 23. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. All right, let's stop now. The rich man's body is buried, but he is not dead himself. His person, his soul, his spirit is still very much alive, but they went straight into hell. Though he had much wealth, though he had much pleasure, though he claimed to be a Jew probably, all right, this is Jesus telling this, uh, he did not know God. He was in hell, he lifted his eyes, he could see, he was in torment, that means he could feel. And it says he saw Abraham afar off and he saw the beggar, Lazarus, calling him by name, was in Abraham's bosom, very much alive, very much enjoying, very much joyful, happy, all right? And so what does he do in verse 24? And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Notice that he said there was fire there. I'm tormented. I'm still alive. He could speak. He could describe what he was going through. Uh, he could recognize Father Abraham. And he said, oh, have mercy. Send Lazarus, please. Just a speck of water to help me out of my misery. All right. So this tells me that after death, the spirit and the soul continue to exist. They continue to live. Uh, but it's only in the realm of the spiritual, no longer here on earth, because the body is what, you know, has to do with the earth. But in the realm of the spirit, the spirit and the soul continue to live. Verse 25. But Abraham said, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. And likewise, 
Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. All right, so remember, all right, when you're on earth. So he could still remember the things on earth. Even though he was in hell, he could remember, all right. Uh, but now this Lazarus, he's in the life hereafter. He's comforted, okay, verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. All right, so there's no communication. And that's what he's saying. I, I can't send Lazarus. Lazarus can't go to you. Neither can you come to me. There's no return, all right? There is no change your mind. There's no just let me visit. No. All right. Let's go to verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. All right. Now, he could not only remember what went on, you know, when he was there on the earth. He remembered his earthly family. And he was concerned for them. I don't want them to come to this terrible place that I'm in. All right. So I'm going to read 28. He said, for I have five brethren that Lazarus may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. He wanted to be able to warn them, his five brothers, who are still alive. He desired, if only I can warn them, this is terrible, this is horrid. I don't want them also to have to suffer the way I'm suffering. And 29, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. That's the Old Testament. All of this tells about hell, all right? It tells about going our own way. It tells about the future of mankind. So verse 30 and 31, I'm just going to finish it off. He said, nay, father, no, that means Abraham, father Abraham. If one went to them from the dead, they would repent. No, they've got to have something more than just the Bible. That's the only Bible that Jesus had. It's the only Bible that the apostles had, the Old Testament. No, no, let somebody rise from the dead and go there. And this is what Moses said. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. All right, which we know because Jesus came, Jesus died, Jesus rose from the grave. And people know that, read about it, hear about it, and they still don't believe, all right? So uh, we're now going to go to B, C, D, E, F. Oh, my, I've only got six. Um, I, I'm going to have to go fast on this, all right? The resurrection of damnation. There is going to be a day of resurrection. And what we need to realize is there are going to be two resurrections. But we are talking about the end of the sinner. So we won't be going into, um, you know, the good resurrection, which comes first. All right. So uh, let's look at. John 5, 28 and 29. Marvel not, at, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. All right, so there's two resurrections. One is called the resurrection of life, eternal life, all right? And the other is called the resurrection of damnation, eternally cut off, 
eternally separated from God Almighty. This will be right at the side of it, a bodily resurrection. The spirit and the soul are still alive, but they will receive a new body, all right? Their bodies will be reunited with the soul. And let me just tell you here, there will be a thousand years in between the end of the good resurrection and the beginning of the bad resurrection. There will be a thousand years. I want to just say right now, uh, starting with the 10th of September, we are going to be having a seminar on Fridays, all right, called End Time Seminar. And there we will go into detail about the resurrections, okay? But now let's go to the next thing. We're talking now only about those the end of the sinner. So uh, their spirits go in to hell. Then they will be resurrected and given a new body. All right. But it will be the resurrection of damnation. They will have to appear before the judgment throne. Revelation 20, 11 to 13. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the, and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which, was in, which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. All right, so please notice that. This great white throne judgment is not for the believer. We will have already had our own judgment of works, all right? Uh, God, God's, when he judges our works, it's called the beam of judgment throne. That, that has not, this is only sinners, and it takes place a thousand years after the other, which is the millennial reign of Christ, when this great white throne judgment happens. And that means those that are also uh, living during the millennial time that get saved and die during that thousand years, they, they appear before this throne, this white throne judgment. So they're judged, everybody, whether great, small, they will give an account to God, all right? And they're judged by what they have done. But if their name is written in the book of life, because you see, maybe some of those in the millennium accept Jesus and want Jesus and serve the Lord, their name will be put into the book of life. This has nothing to do with us before this millennium takes place. Let's go to the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse 14 to 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All right. Now, hell, it says here, death and hell. That's body. Death is the body. Hell is the soul. All right. There, so the hell is not the end. Only the spirit and soul of a man is in hell. There's no body there. I'm sure there are a lot of good people that have done so good by the world standard. And they're going to say there has to be some mistake. There has to be some mistake. Maybe this is just a purgatory. When the real thing comes, then then they'll find out, no. And, and when they're given this resurrected body, it's called fitted for destruction. It's created in a way that it will burn and burn and burn and never burn up. That's a body fitted for destruction, all right? And it says, after that judgment, body, soul, and spirit, that's what it means by death and hell, 
are cast into the lake of fire. That's what it means by the second death. I've told uh, in some of my classes this saying, listen carefully, twice born men, that means mankind, only die once. Once born men die twice. I'm going to say it again. Twice born men. That means you're born naturally, physically, and then you're born again in the realm of the spirit and accept Jesus. You only have to die once. That's your physical death. But if you're only born once, that means in the physical body, but you never give your heart and life to Jesus, your spirit is dead in trespasses and sins, then not only do you have to die physically, but your spirit and soul will go into the lake of fire and it will burn forever and ever. Only those names that are in the book of life don't have to go. And that will be in that millennial reign, that thousand years, people that are born then and die during that thousand years. It's talking about them. The rest of us don't consider that, all right? This is the second death. Let's look at um, 21.8, Revelation. I'm gonna keep you just a few moments so that we can finish to the bottom of the page, all right? If you have to go, you're welcome to go. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All right. Now, Revelation 21, 8 is telling those that live their life full of fear. If you are really born again, you don't need to live your life full of fear. You, you live by faith, amen. The just shall live by faith. And when faith comes in, your hope is in Jesus. Maybe fear tries to attack, but it can't just take over and stay there, all right? Uh, but those that just live, they're full of fear, full of fear. No, uh, fear is the opposite of faith. Unbelieving, they don't believe. They claim with their mouth, but they don't have faith, all right? Then abominable, which are those that commit sin, murders. I, I mean, you just read all their, all of them. And it says all liars, hello? Every kind of a lie. Don't, don't bluff yourself. From young, you know, it's so easy to tell a lie. But if you continue to live like this, lying to get out of things, not telling the truth, deceiving and so forth. People that are Christians do it as well. No, all liars are going to have their part in the lake of fire. So don't bluff yourself. If you claim it here, we have to start living it. And if any of these things uh, are part of our lifestyle, all right, and we're claiming to be a Christian, we need to start repenting and asking God to change us. I, I know this like whoremongers, that means living an unclean sexual life, uh, a loose life. Uh, there are people that claim to be Christians and yet they're living in this way in their life. We need to repent. Don't bluff yourself that grace is gonna cover it. It tells you clearly all of these people are going to end up in the lake of fire and they're gonna be tormented forever. Um, Revelation 19, 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. All right, they were cast alive. That means they knew what was happening for them. Of course, they had body, soul, spirit, and instantly they're given, a, they didn't go to hell. Those two, the Antichrist, you'll learn all about that in the, 
in the seminar that so it's cast alive into this no you're not sedated some people say you know um you're you're, you're just you, you don't know anything about it there's no agony if you don't know about it all right it's very clear you're going to be cast alive 20 revelation 20 all right I, i'm going to talk about this you can put there uh, Romans, New Romans, Revelation 22, verse 2, millennium. That's a fact. He laid hold of the dragon. In this thousand years, the dragon is going to be put into the bottomless pit. That old serpent, which is the devil, Satan, bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, put a seal that he couldn't. During that millennium, there's no devil to go around deceiving people. No devil going around, you know, trying to um, tempt people, all right? But after the thousand years is finished, he will be allowed to come out. And when that thousand years have expired, he'll be loose. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. This is after the thousand years where the beast and false prophet are up there. That's why I put that they're thrown in alive. And a thousand years later, they're still very much alive and suffering and tormented. When the devil is thrown in there with them, these first two are very much alive. All right. Um, Romans 9, I don't think we will read that either i yes we will read it i just romans 9 22 and 23 uh, that's the one that talks about fitted to destruction would you read it for us sure what if god willing to shew his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Yeah, so they will be given bodies that God makes them for these glorified bodies, meaning that, that the body that is this new body, but like here, you know, if, if you are thrown in a fire, you will burn up but he's going to give them a body after they're resurrected, after they come out of the hell, all right, a body that can be thrown in the lake of fire, that body will not ever be destroyed or burned up. It will continue to be terrible where they can feel it, all right? Matthew 24, 51. And shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, so we can see here. I, I was going to give you another verse, but we're running late. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right. Um, yeah, you, you just write this down. Who is it talking about? Um, appointing him his portion with the hypocrites verse 48 of that matthew 24 it's talking about the evil servant that says in his heart oh my lord is delaying his coming and he begins to mistreat his fellow servants to eat and drink so his lifestyle is more like a sinner he lives to himself he lives in a way that is not fitting for the servant of god in verse 50 the lord of that servant is going to come when he doesn't look for him in an hour when he's not aware of it and that brings us to verse 51 cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites because he's been living a hypocritical life claiming to know god but in action and deed living like the man of the world. Well, it's, I've kept you 10 minutes over. It's time for us to quit. All right. I want you all to bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to 
say a brief prayer in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for letting us complete this lesson two, part one. I pray, Lord, with all these that are watching, that are listening, that are tuned into this lesson, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you will speak into our hearts and lives. And should any of these verses be such that you make them real and alive to a person, if they feel convicted by anything, that they will make it right before it's too late. Lord, we have to live our life on guard, being watchful and realizing we are not our own. We're bought with a price. Lord, those that they are teaching, may they, when they come to the end of this lesson, say, I don't want to go to that place. I want to accept Christ. I don't want to be end up in a lake of fire that burns forever and ever. I pray you'll make it so real that when they teach others, it will become very real to those people. In Jesus' name, amen. Goodbye. God bless you. See you next week, Lord willing. Amen.